be here tonight again at the tabernacle to anticipate in this wonderful fellowship and worship around the Word of God, which is given to us freely, and we are love to be partakers of this blessing. And I only trust that God will bless us tonight like He did this morning with the message of the morning. And I was just talking to my neighbor, Mrs. Woods, a while ago, and we were discussing and Mr. Woods and them, and I believe that was Brother Neville's best sermon of all the fine ones he's preached. That was the one that was better to me than anyone he's ever preached yet. I certainly did uh, admire and appreciate that wonderful sermon. And it gave me courage, and it trimmed me down. So I I like to admit the truth, you know, (laughs) about the courageous parts, you know, to be courageous and how David was there and how that he, uh, when in that great trial, instead of saying, well, I'll go do this, and Lord, you just help me, he, wait, he went and asked the Lord what to do. He brought Amen. down the ephob, you know, and said, now let's stand and ask God what must we do in this crisis. Amen. Oh, that was really rich. That had more vitamins than all the drugstores that has got in the country. <laughs> yes, sir, that really do you good. Now, tonight, we, we don't aim to stay not no longer than midnight. If we can on these questions, <laughs> so we are we are going to get right into them right away. It's the finishing up these questions, and every time I start to finish them up, I sit your head. I didn't mean that, you know that. I was just saying that. See? And <laughs> but, uh, I got some real stiff ones here from a minister, and they're really hard to answer. You know, and preachers they twist it around through the Bible and try to find their own answers before they last you. You see. And then, and this is being tape recorded going down to Georgia to a minister friend of mine who's got eight st- outstanding Bible questions here, which are very, very steep. And now, this coming week, don't forget and pray for us. And my wife is way better. She's up now and she helped uh, cook today. Our dear friends uh, from Canada, Brother Sister Softman, are here visiting with us and we surely do appreciate their visit and my wife knowing that they were coming but she was going to be up so she could have some of the entertainment and the fellowship of these dear christian people we're glad to have brother freddie with us tonight and she stayed with uh, she was here this morning but i believe she stayed with no that's right she's with meaty to um kind of be with her while we come down because no it'll be a little late tonight it's communion feet washing so um we're happy to have them and the visitors with us. Now, before we start to try to undertake to answer questions, and just remember that I can be wrong, you see. I, I don't claim to be right on everything that I do. I, I try to be right, but maybe I'm, I'm wrong. And uh, if I am wrong, then you just forgive me, and I pray God will too, because... I don't mean to be wrong. I don't try to answer them just the, uh, the way that I, just for prejudice, I answer them the very best of my knowledge, see. And if I have to alter my ideas on a Bible question, I think that's just the thing to do. We should alter uh, any time when God's Word speaks because it's God's Word. And now I think we're going to pray for the sick again tonight as usual. And sometimes... You just wonder, you take like a small group like this, less than all the little tabernacle here, and sometimes you don't see the results that you would like to see. But the thing, what you're doing, you're just drawing from about 200 people. In one of the big meetings, maybe you're drawing anywhere from three to 10,000, you see, and, and uh, maybe more. So that's where you get to see a more massive, but... Tonight, I've just been answering, of course, our phone rings just every few minutes through day and part of the night. Um, is this Mrs. Ricer sitting here? I'm looking at your Bible, Sister Sister Woods has it back there. I brought it this morning for you, and I, I didn't uh, get to give it to you. I, I didn't see you this morning, and Mrs. Woods has it. So the answering the phone and finding the, the great uh, things that's been done. A uh, lady called me. She said, Brother Branham, I was at a certain, certain meeting and I'd been suffering with certain, certain troubles so long and 
You know, you just spoke back there and just said, I almost fainted when it just brought up the back life and said, and I've never suffered since. And a lady come in and said, I believe she's here tonight or she's going to drive from Bedford. I believe her somewhere up in there that her son was in here. I believe it had heart trouble in such a bad shape. And he was sitting here in the meeting and, and the Lord moved around and touched said to the boy about his trouble and he couldn't hardly raise his arm and a heart attack and his arm all cramped his heart like this and immediately he got right in the car and drove home never been bothered with it since is that lady get here from Bedford are you here late there she is in the back yes she just called me a while ago then um, there's a lady called me from down at Evansville and um, she couldn't get here because she's too far away didn't know we was going to have service tonight of healing and she said brother Branham I was sitting in the Evansville meeting and said, you look back over the crowd and said, told me who I was and what I had done and what I'd suffered with and so forth like that. And she said, I had that asthmatic condition and just had to burn asthma door and everything in the room since I was a little girl. And said, that's been two years ago and I've never had one spot of it since. Amen. And Praise the name of the Lord. Just for those who are here tonight, wasn't here this morning to enjoy the testimony. I was over to the 10 cent store buying a doll yesterday. Now that wasn't for myself, see. That was for my little girl, Rebecca, there. And, and uh, Sarah was going to something other today. Some of her little schoolmates was having some kind of a little get together of a birthday or something. And she'd taken her little present. I was buying a little baby doll about so long. And there was a lady who walked up there and said, Do you remember me? And I said, I don't believe I do. And it come to find out it was a relative of Brother Neville's here that about when I was on my road to Sweden, they, she come in here, had a little boy in a wheelchair just like uh, little Edith there, and a little fellow had cancer, malignant growth on the brain, and his little head drawed down, and, he, and the doctors had given him just three weeks to live. They had taken it out and diagnosed it and seen it was what it was, and just gave him three weeks to live. And they had to wheel him around in the chair and then put him on a stretcher when he went to the room and examine him and then bring him back down. Went and prayed for that little boy and asked the Lord to heal him. And the very next day when they took him over there, he said, I don't own that wheelchair. Got into the car and rode over there and the doctor rolled out the stretcher. He said, I don't want that stretcher. Run up there and sit down. Doctor examined him. said, well. <laughs> said, instead of three weeks, I'm going to give you 108 years you go to live. <laughs> And yesterday the mother met me, and she may be here for all I know tonight, and the little boy is out playing football, a young man now, malignant cancer on the Amen. brain. And uh, it just goes to show all of the thousands of things God cannot fail. He, he just can't fail. Brother John is your eye better, brother. Uh, uh, he had an accident, was driving a nail, and it struck him in the eye. And we were all praying for Brother John O'Bannon, our brother from Louisville, that had had the accident with the nail, it struck him in the eye. Now, <clears throat> these questions are the, the deepness of somebody's heart that they read through the Scripture and find these things, and they don't maybe can't satisfy themselves. So they hand them in here for us to try to answer, and you see what a predicament it puts us in, because what you'd say, they lay on to it. So you must be sure you're right, and I'm as sure as you can be. So then the thing to be sure that we're right, let's just ask the Holy Spirit now to interpret this for us while we bow our heads. Now, Heavenly Father, oh, what a privilege it is to say Father to the great Creator of heavens and earth. And we just ask that you will take these questions into your own care now. They were handed in here with the deepest of sincerity. God, let that come from our hearts, the deepest of sincerity, to answer them in the best that we know how. Grant it. And may thy mercies rest upon each one, and may something be said here tonight that will just help everyone that's here. And when we leave, after the prayer for the sick and taken to the communion and so forth, may we say like those who came from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
Now, as I have said many times, that these these here are are the best of my opinion of them. And then sometimes it raises a little discussion. The first one here I see is something I've said before that it's handed back again. I won't want to read it now, if you will. When Adam and Eve had their children in Eden, was there other people on earth at this time? In Genesis, the fifth chapter and the sixteenth verse, Cain dwelt in the land of Nod and knew his wife. Now, that's a, a wonderful question. Now, we are taught in the Bible, and many times, these sometimes we have carelessly, I used to put on a little slip of paper and say, Ask, answer any Bible question. And someone said, uh, well, who was Cain's wife? Oh, I would a little joke with it or something. I'd say, oh, that was his mother-in-law's daughter, something like that, you know, or, or she was Miss Cain. But that don't answer the question. There's, there, Cain had a wife because the Bible said he did. And if Cain had a wife, he had to get her somewhere. And this would line right into it here. Was there other people on the earth when Adam and Eve had their children in the Garden of Eden? Now, if you notice, in the Bible, it's very seldom ever recorded about a woman being born. It's always the man-child is the one that they record in the Bible, not the woman. Seldom is it ever mentioned about the birth of a girl baby in the Bible, or as frankly I don't know as I can recall one right straight off now in mine, uh, where ever recorded a birth of a baby. It said they begot sons and daughters. Now the Bible only gives record of three children being born to Adam and Eve, and that was uh, Cain, Abel, and Seth. Now, if all three of those being man, if there wasn't any females born, and then when the only female, Eve, died, the human race would have ceased to exist right then, because there'd been no way for them to, to have any, the human race to have furthered because there would have been no females left. Eve would have been the only one. But you see, they don't record the, the birth of girl babies in the Bible, so therefore they had to have girls as same as boys. Now the old writer, one of the most ancient writers we got, Josephus, claims they had 70 children at Adam and Eve, one of the oldest writers. 70 children, and they were both sons and daughters. Now, if... And then if Cain went to the land of Nod, now if you notice the writer was very, very brilliant writing here. Did you notice how I quoted it? In Eden, when they had their children in Eden, now not in the Garden of Eden, the writer knew, that ever who wrote the note here, said, and Adam and Eve had their children in Eden, not in the Garden of Eden, because they'd been driven out of the Garden of Eden, but they were still in Eden, and the Garden of Eden laid east in Eden. But Eden was like a county or, or, what, or a state. And then Nob was another state or county next to it. Now, the only person that Cain could have had or married would have had to be his own sister. He had to because there's only one male and female that they could have come from, see. And he had to marry his own sister. Now, that was legal in those days. Uh, Isaac married his own first blood cousin, Rebecca ordained of God. Sarah was Abraham's sister, his blood sister. Not by his mother, by his father. See? A blood sister that at Abraham married. A different mother, but same father. So you see, to marry in relation then, before the, the stream of blood was weakened in the human race, it was legal and all right. Now it isn't. If you'd marry your sister today and have children, they'd probably be uh, well, they'd just be deformed and everything, even down to a first and second cousin should never be married. See, because the bloodstream becoming low and running low. But the only thing then that Cain could have done would have been marry his own sister. And that's where the children was that he uh, got his wife, went to the land of Nod and knew her, and from there come the, the children. See, the, and if you notice, out of the line of Cain come the smart man. Out of the line of Seth come the religious man. I mean the, the vine of righteousness. 
Right there, those two brought forth the very line that we're living in today. If you'll notice today, now, just in finishing this question, that lineage of Cain still exists, and the lineage of Seth still exists. They've both come down just the same. Cain's children is here in Jeffersonville tonight, and Seth's children is here in Jeffersonville tonight. As the bloodstream weakens and goes out, but that lineage still hangs on. Now watch. Cain's children were always, and before the Andalusian destruction, they were the smart people, the scientists, the educators, and very religious, but was the condemned bunch. See? Now watch. They were just like their father Cain. Cain, he was a religious man. He built a beautiful altar, made a beautiful church, and tried to make it look prettier than that little mission that Asaph had down there. Did you know that? He sure ate. He decorated the altar with flowers and fixed it beautiful and made it pretty and made a great big swell church because he thought that he could find favor with God by doing so. And Abel went over and got a little lamb and started pulling it over to the altar and laid it on a rock and killed it. And now, if God being just, if all he required was worship, Cain worshipped God with just as much sincerity as Abel did. Both of them were sincere. Both of them were trying to find grace with God. They were neither one of them infidel. They were both absolutely believers in Jehovah. Now there, that gives us something to think of. Some here tonight, I've never seen people, I've never seen you before. But you must realize this and keep this in your mind. See, no matter how religious you are, that don't have one thing to do with it. You might live in church, you might be ever so sincere, and you're still lost. See? And you say, well, you say our pastors are the smartest. They come to the seminaries to get the best education. They're theologians. They know all, all the theologies and so forth, and they're smart, trained the very the elected best that we know of, and they could still be lost. Amen. See? Now, Cain, on his line, they were everyone very religious, a very famous people, and they were scientists and doctors and builders and workers and smart men. But all that lineage was rejected from Cain all the way down. And on Abel's side, they wasn't builders or educators or smart men. They were a more or less humble sort of sheep raisers and peasants that just walked by the Spirit. Amen. Now, the Bible said there's no condemnation to them that's in Christ Jesus that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The spiritual man has a spiritual soul that can never die. And the carnal man has a religious atmosphere around him and wants to worship and so forth, but is carnal. Amen. Not an unbeliever, but a carnal believer. Amen. And it was the kind was rejected. Now, from there, Cain went and married his wife in the land of Nod. Now, it doesn't say who Seth married or who others married. And the very beautiful uh, uh, thing of that is to know that, that uh, Cain marrying, we had the answer to it because he had to marry his sister or, he, or been, there was more and more women on the earth. But this had to come from Eve. She was the mother of all living. That's all the people that was living. She was the mother of it. That's the reason she, the word Eve means the mother of the living. So she came and brought this child and Cain married his own sister would be the only way that I could see out of it. So there was people living in that day, truly, see. Well, and when Adam and Eve had their children in Eden, now watch, well, that's the question. When they had their children in Eden, was there other people on earth at this time? No. Then in Genesis 5.16, you see, Cain dwelt in the land of Nod and knew his wife. Sure. See, that Genesis 1 where he created man in his own image, which was in the theosomy, 
And in Genesis 2, he made man out of the dust of the earth, which is the human man that we have now. And then in 3 was the fall and was kicked from the Garden of Eden. And then the children be begat children. And Cain took his wife and lived with her in the land of Nod outside because God had separated him from the fellowship with his own brother because of the death of, of Abel. And that's who he had, his own sister, and married her. It's the only way that I could myself can see how that, that he married. Now, it's been said, and I hope that my colored friends it's in here will excuse this r remark because it's absolutely not right. The first time I ever met anyone in my life, uh, uh, after I'd been converted, I was met Brother George D. Ark and them down there, and I was walked in. The Lord led me to a little place and was discussing where the colored man came from. And they were trying to say that the colored man that came married an animal, like an ape, and through there come forth the colored race. Now, that's wrong. Absolutely that's wrong. And don't never stand for that. Because there was no color or white or any other different. There's just one race of people into the flood. Then after the flood and the Tower of Babel, when they begin to scatter out, that's when they're taking their colors and so forth. They all come from the same tree. That's exactly right. Adam and Eve was the father and mother, earthly, of every living creature of human beings that's ever been on the earth. That's right. Black, white, pale, brown, yellow, whatever color you might be. That's absolutely the place that you live in and the way that, at the, just like I think I might express this while I'm on it, the people here now in these segregations and laws and things that are passing, I think it's ridiculous. Amen. I really do. Amen. Listen, just let those people alone. Amen. They know what they want. God Amen. made a man a colored man and he's happy about it. Amen. Absolutely. If God made me a colored man, I'd be happy about it. If he made me a brown man, I'd be happy. If he made me a white man, I'm happy. If he made me a yellow man, I'd be happy. Amen. God made us in our colors, and he made us the way he wanted us, and we're all his children. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. And they oughtn't to fuss and carry on like that. Amen. That's wrong to do that. They shouldn't do it. God made us the way we wanted. And the colored man, he don't want to get out there and break up his, his generation or his color, mix it in with the other white and everything like that, I don't blame him. Amen. I don't. The colored man has things that the white man don't even possess. Amen. Absolutely. It's yeah. exactly right. God never intended him to be that way. Well, look, the colored man, is, he's, he's, well, he's, got a, a, he's got a disposition about him that the white man never does have. Amen. He's got a happy-go-lucky, a trust God, and just let the rest of it go, whether he's got it or whether he hasn't, he's happy anyhow. Amen. I'd like to have a whole lot of that tonight. <laughs> Amen. I sure would. Well, he's got it, and that's his possession. He don't want to mix it up with some other race and break it out either. Amen. That's exactly right. I think the lady down there at Shreveport made one of the best, uh, best comments I ever heard in my life. She made a comment, and they put it in the paper. She walked up, she said, the way these things are going in here in this segregation, I don't want my children going to school or a uh, white school. Said they won't get the attention they'd have if they had a colored teacher. Amen. That woman's smart woman. She knows what she was talking about. They get a better education. That's exactly right. So Amen. I think that people do wrong by doing that. And then they say Cain and Abel and so forth like that. No, sir. The color had nothing to do with it. It's the spirit inside of there that has something to do with Amen. it. That's exactly right. So... Cain knew his wife, and that was his sister. And they, he took her to the land of Nod, and there come forth the great uh, tribes of the earth, the religionists and uh, worshipers. And just think today, friend, just stop and think this for a moment, that there are tens of thousands times tens of thousands and thousands of thousands of absolutely church-going people just as sincere and consecrated as that church may be, that's just as far lost as Cain was. Amen. See? Amen. It's God who chooses. It's God who elects. See? God who gives mercy. The clay can't say to the potter, it's the potter over the clay. Amen. That's right. Now, here's a beautiful one. Here's the next one here. In 2 Peter 2, 4, 2 and 4, somebody got a Bible and want to turn to these scriptures right quick while I'm uh, reading them if you want to. And... Uh, Kind of help me along here while we get this question. Now, on this Cain and 
and um, so forth. If that don't uh, satisfy it now, you just uh, let us have it. We'll be glad. Now, Second Peter 2 and 4. All right, sir, here we are. Second Peter 2 and 4. For if God, had, if, or if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down into hell, then why did Christ preach to the spirits in prison? And First Peter 3, 19. Now we've got Peter 2 and 4 first. All right. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down, um, down to hell, and... Uh, and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto the judgment. Now, now let's find out in First Peter, that's Second Peter, First Peter three nineteen. Listen to this. Um, here we are, right here. These just come in the reason I didn't have them wrote out. Which also went and preached to the spirits in prison. Oh yes, here we are. Let's begin a little before that. The eighteenth verse. For Christ also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient. Uh, my dear friend, if you just read the next verse, it explained it. See? Which were sometimes disobedient, which once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark being prepared, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. See? Now, if you'll notice in here, I think this preacher's got another one on the, something on the same line. will be answered a little later. First Peter 4, or 2 and 4, if you notice, for if God spared not the angels, how's that angel spell? Little a. See? Now, over here, the spirits that were in prison that repented not in the long suffering of the days of Noah, same angel. It was man, messengers, preachers, spared not the angel. Did you know that uh, the word angel comes from the word a messenger? How many know that angel is a messenger? Absolutely. Angel is a messenger. And he spared not the angels. See? And over here in the Hebrews, remember we went through it a few weeks ago? The angels, and over in, the, in the Revelation, to the angel of the church of Sardis, write these things, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, to the angel of the church. Remember that? And we run the angel word back in, from the dictionary and find out that means a messenger. It could be a messenger on earth, a supernatural messenger. The word angel. So in this state, if we take the lecture and run it back, you'll find out it starts from messengers. The first messengers. See, if, the, if he spared not, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, see, and the supernatural beings, see, after the waiting, I watch you say, spare not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness, to be preserved unto judgment. Then look over in First Peter here again, three nineteen. Watch how this reads now. For by which also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. See, it was the messengers of that day. Messengers. While the ark was being prepared, wherein that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now, if you'll notice, when those beings were in heaven, now over in Revelation 11, or the 7th chapter, I believe, or the Lord's 12th chapter, he gives a picture of the woman standing, the moon at her head and the sun, uh, the sun at her head and the moon under her feet. And the red dragon stood to devour the child as soon as he was born. And he took his tail and pulled a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Did you notice that? Now that doesn't mean that Satan has a, a long tail that he hooked around people. But the tail that he told and pulled a third part 
of those stars. Those stars were Abraham's seed. Abraham said, oh, God told Abraham, look up to the heavens and number the stars if you can. He said, I can't do it. He said, neither will you be able to number your seed, the stars. Who is the bright morning star? Jesus of Nazareth, the brightest that ever lived in human flesh. He is the bright morning star, and he is the seed of Abraham. Coming through Isaac and we being dead in Christ, take on Abraham's seed and our heirs according to the promise. So the stars of the heaven represented the spirits of man here. And when the red dragon Rome under its persecution hugged in two thirds of the, or third of the stars and cast them down, that was at the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus when they rejected him and he was and cast him out and had nothing to do with him. There was that third part of the angelic stars, the angelic beings. See, in your body, inside of you, we've got another question on that directly to answer it better. So when inside of you is the spirit, another man, the outside of you is the one man, the inside of you is another man. So the inside of you is the supernatural, the outside of you is the physical. Amen. See? And this being, if you are spirit led by God, you became a messenger of God. Or an angel, God's messenger, God's angel is the very same word. Amen. Stay separated. God's messenger or God's angel. And which has the greatest authority, an angel from heaven or an angel at the pulpit? Amen. Which has it? The angel at the pulpit. Paul said, if an angel from heaven comes and preach any other gospel to you than this which I've already preached, let him be accursed. So the angel anointed with the Holy Spirit and with the Word stands next to God. Amen. That's right, in the heavens. His authority, all powers in heaven and earth Amen. is given into my hand. Amen. Go and I'll go with you. Praise Whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. What you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. Praise oh, if the great... Holy Church only realized its power to do these things. Amen. But there's so much doubt and fear and trembling, wondering if it will, Amen. could it happen. As long as that exists, the church can never stand upright. Amen. And when every thought of fear is vanished and the Holy Spirit is completely in control of the church, then all fears are gone. And that church has the power. Amen. In, well, they have everything that heaven owns behind them. They're ambassadors of the throne. Amen. Absolutely, an ambassador of Christ has the authority and everything that Christ owns belongs to that ambassador. Amen. And he said, go ye to all the world. You are my witnesses after the Holy Ghost has come on you. Amen. And what is a witness as an ambassador? It's to come and witness something. The whole powers of heaven is right in your hands. Amen. Oh, why do we sit and the church is barren and we sit dormant? It's because that we don't recognize these things. Amen. Now, the souls that were in prison that repented not were not angelic beings that had, had been brought down in the form of angels, but it was the spirits of those angelic beings that fell before the foundation of the world. Back there when the war went on in heaven and Satan and, and the dragon fought. And in the, uh, Michael and, and the, the dragon fought and Lucifer. And Lucifer was cast out with all of his children. All of the angels that he had deceived. And those angels come to the earth and was subject then to become human. And when they did, that's when the sons of God saw the daughters of man was there. And took unto them wives. They are sons of God. Every man that's born in this earth is the son of God. Amen. Regardless of whether he's a sinner or what he is, he's the son of God. Created in the image of God for the praises of God. Amen. He's created that way, but God in the beginning knew who would receive him and who would not receive him. Therefore, he could predestinate. 
or not predestinate, but by foreknowledge he could tell who would be saved and who wouldn't be saved. For he knew which person would take up which spirit. And those spirits that come from the throne of God and stands before the throne of God and lived in billions and billions and aeons of time before the world ever began in the presence of God, you think they don't know something about worship? Amen. And they come down and get right into man and they worship God. Absolutely they worship God. And they have a knowledge of God and they're smart and shrewd and educated. Always. But God rejected them from the beginning. So therefore, friends, membership of a church or, or knowledge of some theology or something doesn't have one thing to Amen. do with it. It's got to be the blood of Jesus Christ and a new birth that joins you to Him as one person. There you are. God in the beginning when He knows that man and woman was made one, not two. They were made one. They were separated. One put in flesh and one in a theosity. Amen. He knew that. So in order to prove that to you, when God made the woman, he never took some dust and made her like he did the man. He took a rib out of the side of Adam and she become a byproduct of a man because she's part of him. Amen. You get it now? Amen. There you are. There are the angels and God and the spirit that's joined with God is one spirit. Amen. That's right. Now, the Spirit of God that dwells in the church is the Spirit that come from heaven that God knew before the foundation of the world that rejected the devil's eye. Amen. And that Spirit had to take a body of flesh to be to take his testings. Amen. He had to come flesh like these others did and all of them put on the equal yoke. And God, by the beginning, know the spirits that would and which would not. Amen. There you are, that devil is so wise, he is to see the very elect if possible. So these spirits, these angels that preached, was in prison, angels, if you notice it here, it's a little A, which means man, angels, messengers here on the earth, they sinned. And the only way they could sin would be disbelief. And the way they had their own religions and they did not believe the message of Noah. They did not believe the message of Enoch. And they rejected their message and was condemned. The Bible said they were. Enoch prophesied to them. Said the Lord's a coming with ten thousands of his saints. Amen. And they prophesied and Noah built an ark and they said he's a holy roller. He's a fanatic. There is no such a thing as a rain coming. And 120 years went on, and he had a religion that had salvation in it. Amen. That was a way of escape made, but they were satisfied in their condition. Amen. That's the way it is today that men are satisfied in their condition. But there is a way of escape, and that Amen. way through Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. There you are, the same tribe, the same spirit. Amen. They were absolutely religious men, very religious. But they missed the covenant vow. Amen. So is it today. Men go to church and join big churches and try to be the most popular person in the city. If they want to join a church to get the biggest in the city, the best and well thought of in the city. How far they miss the calling. How far they miss it. Amen. The only way you'll ever know Jesus Christ is by spiritual revelation. Amen. Not by theology and how much you study the Bible. Whether you be Christian, science, Methodist, Jehovah's Witness, or whatever you are. Amen. No matter what you are, you'll never know it by the Word. It's the Spirit of God that reveals Him to you. Amen. It's a spiritual revelation. Praise the Lord. Adam in the Garden of Eden and Eve, when those children was cast out, here come Cain with good theology. He said, God should know that we're doing this for the best, best of my heart. I build a beautiful altar. I put flowers on it. I put fruits on it. I make it pretty. Surely I can appease God, but this lady know that I'm sincere in my heart. He was right as far as the word went. God wanted worship. He went to worship. He made a beautiful place to worship in. Great fine cathedral, as they call it today. And he made it right. He built it right. He put an altar in it. He wasn't an infidel, but able upon the word of God. There was no Bible wrote then. But God revealed to him Amen. that it wasn't fruit that brought us out of the Garden of Eden. It wasn't apples that Adam and Eve ate. 
It was absolutely sexual things. And it separated them and divided them. And knowing that they become mortal and through yeah. the blood of Adam and through the blood of the serpent that as far as this, able by divine revelation, went and got a lamb and offered it. And God said, that's it. Amen. Sure. When they come down off of Mount Transfiguration, Jesus said, who does man say, I the son of man am? Some say you're Moses and some say you're Elias and some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're that prophet. He said, but who do you say I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, blessed art thou, Simon and Bartholomew, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Watch. Not no more through the letter, not no more through the school. You never learned it in a seminary and neither did somebody tell you. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father which is in heaven has revealed to you. And upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell can't prevail against it. There you are. There's the church of the living God. That's it. Upon that church, upon that revelation this church is built. It's a divine revelation that God has revealed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you've accepted Him as your personal Savior and you've passed from death into life and the Holy Spirit's are moving and working in the members of this body. Amen. There's the church, no matter if it's poured in a mission, it's sent out under a pine tree somewhere or wherever it is, but it's in somebody's house in a private meeting. No matter where it would be. Amen. Beauty and things doesn't enchant God. It's the sincerity of the heart by a revelation that Amen. Jesus Christ has been presented as the Son of God, a personal Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, we can never get these go through like that, will we? There's the ones that over there that he went, the angels, the messengers, the preachers, the intellectuals, the messengers that believe not when Noah went to preach to them and told them, well, come into this ark. They said, listen to that holy roller. Listen to that fanatic. Well, there's no rain. Who ever heard of such a thing? Why, my, don't we have churches? Aren't we religious? Well, they were religious. Jesus said it would be a generation that passed just then, would be, that generation would repeat again just before his coming. As it was in the days of Noah. Amen. So will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Amen. For they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. They had a Reno, Nevada then somewhere. Yeah. They had all kinds of nonsense as they got today. Rallying and frolicking and making fun and scoffers and so forth. Having a form of godliness, Amen. but denying the real truth, Amen. the covenant, the message of grace, God making His way, giving the people His His covenant. How they could escape? It had salvation in it. Salvation was a place to escape. What do we need for salvation today? People say, "Aren't we living under a good democratic form of government?" What do we need? I don't care how much democratic form of government we live. We need the blood of Amen. Jesus Christ. Right? We need Christ. I appreciate a democratic form of government that has nothing to do with the salvation of the soul. Amen. Absolutely. Those governments will pass and every nation will pass. And I've stood by the, where the Pharaohs stood and have to dig 20 feet under the ground to find their thrones where they sit. All the Pharaohs and his kingdoms of this earth and all his paltry things will pale and go away, but Jehovah will reign forever. Amen. For he's the immortal Amen. God. Solidly up on the rock, Christ Jesus, we stand Amen. for all other grounds and sinking sand. Share with his kingdoms and rise and fail. Look, oh, there's nothing, I don't care whether it's anything, there's nothing present, nothing future, nothing starvations or perils or anything can ever separate us from that love of God that's in Christ. When a man is born with the Spirit of God, he's a creature no longer of time, but he's a creature of eternity. Hallelujah. Amen. He's passed from death into life. He's passed from it. He's passed from the time element into the eternity. He can never perish, and God swore that he'd raise him up in the last days. So they can have all your big churches and all your big times and all you wish to and tell your dirty jokes and have your bunk coat games and soup suppers and everything else that you want to and have some educated preacher stand there. Maybe you can do a better job at it than some of these little boys, Harley. Those are ABCs. 
But I'm telling you the truth, I'd rather have a boy didn't know his ABCs preaching to me that know Christ and all the great theologians there is with all your education can be thought of. Absolutely. Down here in Kentucky not long ago, a little old boy couldn't even hardly read his own name. So the Lord called him to preach and he wanted a schoolhouse while the authorities wouldn't let him have it. Some great big preacher come by there with a handle on his name like that. Some great doctor of divinity. Well, they let him have the school, sure. He held a two-week revival, not one soul. And his father went back and said, Now, if you let him have it, I'm a taxpayer. I've got a right for my boy to have it. Uh, my boy should have it also. So he went back to find out. And they said, Well, we'll let him have at least two nights. And he went out and let him have two nights. That night, that little old boy got up there and couldn't even read the Bible. Had somebody read his text. But when he walked to the platform, he was anointed with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And when he preached, about 20 come to the altar, and that self-bound preacher went her way through the Calvary at the altar. Sure, brother. It's not, it's not what you know, it's who you know. That's the idea. That's what it takes. It takes to know Christ, to know Him is life, to reject Him is death. Quickly, two or other questions. The question is now that goes down to Georgia. What do the stones in the, uh, represent in Revelations 21, 19, and 20? If you wish to take the time to open your Bibles, which we're having too much time now, but I'll try to answer them quickly. Revelations 20, I believe it's 21, 19, and 20, yes. All right, in there you'll find out that he was talking of the stones that was in the building. And the stones were foundations. If you'll notice, I uh, believe you have it there, Brother Neville. And each stone was a foundation. Not one stone a foundation of the others, but each stone was a foundation. Each stone was a constant foundation. And there were twelve stones. And if you notice, those twelve stones give each first starting out with Jasper and Sardis and so forth like that, representing each stone. In the Bible there, you find out it was called certain stones. Some of them a little different. You never heard of it. If you look back to the dictionary, you find out it's the same stone, just a different name changed. But it starts out with, with Jasper. Jasper was a stone of, of Benjamin, of the stone of uh, oh, the first son, Ju uh, Reuben. The first stone was Reuben, which was Jasper. The last stone was Benjamin, the last stone on top. Now, these twelve stones that the foundations were laid on, then... Them twelve stones hung on the breastplate of Aaron. And they, he represented, he was a high priest of these, of these tribes. Each one of their birth stones in here. In this, this plate. And when the people saw this plate, they recognized that Aaron was the high priest of that entire tribe. When they seen the birth stone in this plate. Now, when we got this morning in Brother Neville's message. And as many times they brought the Urim Thundum. You see it mentioned in the Bible. It's a way they know whether a message was truth or not. Those stones, when they would go to telling what the man said, the prophet prophesied, and those stones all reflected together. It made a conglomeration of light that took sapphire uh, and jasper and carbuncle and all those other stones reflecting their light. It made one great, big, beautiful rainbow color that blended the whole thing together. Now, now the day when that Urim Thundum was taken away with that priesthood, now this Bible is God's Urim Thundum today. And when a preacher preaches, it must not be just one little place here, and that's all he puts his hopes up on. It must be the entire Bible reflecting the message that the man's a preaching. That is the thing. Not just one place. And say, well, the Bible says this. Oh, sure, it says lots of things. But you must make it all be put together. And when the Spirit of God comes and gets into the, the Word, it places it all together and reflects one great big light, and that light is Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Now, these twelve stones are twelve foundations. That will start out from Reuben and Gad and on down to Benjamin. Twelve tribes, twelve stones. And those stones in the temple, in the new heavenly Jerusalem, each foundation will be laid upon one of the patriarchs. Now watch you notice the stones. Now you're going to watch them patriarchs reflected right into something else. Just in another question. Explain, uh, explain the, fourth be the four beasts of Revelation 5. Brother Neville, if you've got that right there close, or some of you, of Revelation 5, we'll read this just for a minute. 
It's a, it's a beautiful picture here of the... Here I have it myself. Revelation, the fifth chapter. And I saw in the right hand of him that set up upon the, upon the throne a book written within and without. And, and, uh, and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I... Now that's not the place I'm wanting to get this a little further. The four beasts, I see. The fourteenth verse. All right, sir. Now here we go. That's right. Now let's begin up here at the at the twelfth verse. All I guess. The, and the four beasts said, "Amen." Now there's a little place behind that, brother Neville. Behold, I heard the voice. Let's see, just a minute. I was reading it a while ago. Oh, here we are. Let's begin at the sixth verse. Um, the fifth verse, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And I beheld it in the midst of the throne, and four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven heads and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits sent forth from unto the earth. I want you to hold that question and if I don't catch it down here in a minute, I want you to bring back again. I want to deal on that the seven spirits of the seven eyes that was on the Lamb. Oh, that's a real beautiful thing. Well, we want to get this brother's question now. All right, don't forget that now. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. When he had taken it, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, every one of them having hearts. Now, that's the, the, four, the four beasts here. If you'll notice, now let's go ahead and read this a little farther. Golden heart, full of vials and odors, and prayers of saints. And they sang a new song. Thou art worthy. And went ahead and made their, all their worship to the Lord. Now, these four beasts of Revelation, if you notice them, every place you Bible readers in which the man is going to listen to this uh, tape recording, those four beasts, they had four faces. One had a face like a man, the other had a face like an ox, and the other face was like an eagle, and the other face was like a lion. And they never went backwards. They couldn't go backwards. How many of you remember the old book of Revelations when they taught it years ago when I talked about two years here on the book of Revelation? A lot of the old timers do. Look, they could not go backwards because every way they went, they were going forward. If they went this way, they was going like a man. If they went this way, they was going like a lion. Went this way, they was going like an eagle. If they went this way, they was going like an ox. See, they couldn't go backwards. They were going forward all the time. Now, those four beasts, now to quickly get this, because I don't want to stay too long on this, but the four beasts, the beast in Bible represents power. And you notice these beasts were not out yonder in the lake or in the sea somewhere coming up, but they were at the throne of God. And they were worshiping God. Those four beasts means four powers that come up out of the earth and those four powers was the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. One don't contradict the other. And one of them, the, as the Gospel goes forth as a lion, it stirs, bold. The Gospel is brave like a lion. And it's a king like a lion. If it goes towards a man's face, it's cunning and shrewd like a man. If it goes to the eagle, it's got the swift wings and the high heights. It, see what I mean? If it goes like the ox, it's a workhorse that can pull the work off, that pulls the, the, the burden of the gospel. The four beasts was the four powers which were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels that rang out in the presence of God. Amen. That was, if you notice, they had eyes in front and in the back. They, everywhere it went, it reflected. They seen everywhere they were going. That's the power of the Gospels. As it goes out, it can, it's got the shrewdness of a man. It's got the swiftness of an eagle. It's got the, 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 the power, the pulling power, the burden barrier, like an ox. It's got the, the sternness and the boldness of a lion. See? It's the four Gospels, which are the four powers of the Revelation, the fourth chapter. All right? 
Now, the next, who are the twenty and four elders? All right? I believe that would be on the, the who are the twenty four elders? Now, that's just simple. We could get to it. The twenty four elders were sitting before the throne. That's in the ver- I believe it's in verse four is where it's found. And there went out another, I've got the, let's see, uh, 410. All right, uh, Revelations, the fourth chapter and the tenth verse. That's right. We'll get to it. And the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, the four and twenty elders, an elder is an overseer. Now, notice there were twelve patriarchs and twelve apostles. And they were setting twelve on one side and twelve on the other. There were the twenty and four elders, which were the twelve patriarchs on one side of the Old Testament, the twelve apostles on the other side of the New Testament. Didn't Jesus say you'll sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel? Amen. Now the foundation is up. There's even a tree in there. And the tree on either side bears twelve manners of fruit. And they yield their fruit once a month, which is twelve months in a year. They render twelve manners of fruit every year as it goes by. Twelve is that worship number, you see. And there's a twenty and four. Between twenty-four, twelve apostles and twelve patriarchs. They're sitting at the throne. All right. Now the fourth verse. Or the fourth question. What did the scarlet thread in Genesis 38 represent? The scarlet thread, if you'll notice, it was Judah, and he uh, had a son, and one of his sons married a Canaanite woman. And this Canaanite woman didn't have any children, and his son died. Then the law then was to take the next son, had to take the brother's wife, and raise up seed to the dead. And the other man did not cooperate and do as he should do, and the Lord slayed him. Then he had one young son. So Judah said, wait till this son drives, grows up until a place where you can marry him. And when he grew up to a place that he was supposed to marry his two brothers' former wife, well, when he was supposed to take her then to raise feet up to his brethren that had, been, had died before him, Judah did not give the woman, the Canaanite woman, the son, the boy. And just let him go ahead. So she seen that she was doing wrong. So she goes out and wraps a veil over her face and set in a public place as a harlot would set. Judah come by and took the woman as his wife and she was a harlot and lived with her and said, she said, well, what would you bargain with me? And he, she said, he said, to give him a, a kid. He said, well, give me a sign that you'll do it. So she took his staff and his signet and so forth and kept it. And when they brought the kids, they couldn't find the harlot because she wasn't a harlot. After a while, she showed up and she was to be a mother. And when she showed up as she used to be a mother, they come told you to thy daughter-in-law has played the part of a harlot. Said, because that she's, she's to be mother, and your both boys are dead. He said, well, she'll be called forth and burn her. And so she sent word to Judah, and she said, the man that did this owned this staff and this sigmund. All right, that was her father-in-law. And he said, she's more righteous than I am. Now, when she, her children was to be delivered, there were twins. And when the twin, the first baby that was to be born, the old Jewish custom, the first child has the birthright. The first child to break forth, and that, remember, was her first child. None of the rest of the boys had had any children by her. She never had a child at this time. And when her first child broke forth, it was just the hand. And the midwife put a scarlet streak around because the scarlet streak spake of redemption that the first son of the Virgin Mary would be have the scarlet streak of redemption. And when he drew his hand back, the other one come first. And when he did say, why did you do this? The other one has the birthright. So that's what Genesis 38 means, you see. That the first child still remains until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the first was under the redempting law. 
Do you know I've said the little new you I've told about? That his eyes was whatever more his ears broke down. But if he is born with a birthright, an innocent, perfect lamb died in his place. Man. There it is. So that was for the birthright. The first baby that broke forth from the mother and had seen that hand and knew that it might turn back again. And when he pushed forth his hand to show that he had it, he was the first one. The midwife bound this scarlet thread around it and he pulled his hand back. See, but absolutely he was the first. That was the scarlet streak. The scarlet streak is all the way through the Bible. That means redemption, which is pointing forward to the first child coming, the first horse born, the first cow born, ever what it was. Everything that was born first to come forth was under redemption. Man. Had to be redeemed. Everything had to be redeemed. Hallelujah. Man. Oh, that just thrills me. Do you get it? Man. The first had to be redeemed. It was a law. Blessed it be the name of the Lord. Amen. And when Jesus Christ was born, he redeemed the whole world. Amen. Certainly he did. He was the redeemer of every creature that was ever created on the earth. He was the redeemer. And it, all redemption lays in him. And no other way at all can you ever come by good works, by joining churches, Whatever it is, you must come by that scarlet streak, that Amen. Redeemer, that kinsman Redeemer. All right. Now, the next is, where are the gifts, what are the gifts to be sent regarding the death of the two witnesses of Revelation 11? Oh, Brother Palmer, if you can't ask some questions. Now, the redemption, these streaks here, these scarlet streak, we see it remains redemption. Now, the next question is, what is the gifts? In Revelation 11, there's coming a time. Now, here's going to answer a question that was answered the other night that a preacher, a friend of mine, wrote about the Jews, how it would be. Now, these Jews have got three and a half years promised to them. How many knows that? Seventy weeks was promised. Said Messiah will come and be cut off in the midst. Three and a half years, Christ preached. Was killed in exactly three and a half years. Three years and six months, he preached. And then, the abomination make a desolation. The, the Muslim of Omer was put on the holy ground. As God said, 2,500 years before it happened, it would be standing there. The prophet saw it and seen it and said, they would, the Gentiles would be in possession there until the Gentiles' dispensation would be finished. Now, there are still three and a half years promised. If you notice these witnesses of Revelations 11 prophesy 1,203 score days. Exactly. Three and a half years. Now, and they were in sackcloth. Now watch their ministry, what they are. Now these two witnesses are killed. Now they, they return to the Jews after the rapture of the Gentile church. The Gentile church goes home for the wedding supper and as Rebecca was taken into Abraham's place with Isaac and there was buried and Rebekah and Isaac come out with full possession of everything that Abraham had. It all went to Isaac. Absolutely. And it could not come to Isaac until first Isaac was married. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. There you are. And Christ becomes, God dwells in that perfect north, marred body completely forever and to eternity. When the Lamb and the Bride is married in heaven, she walks Amen. out in full possession. Amen. Absolutely. Isaac and Rebekah came forth in full possession. And while this ceremony is going on in heaven, of uh, the bride, the Gentile bride being married to the Prince, God's Son, in glory, while they are being married, there's three and a half years that takes place while the Moses and Elijah which Moses was never absent, no, his body was packed away. The angels took him. He did not mortify. He did not corrupt. He was a perfect type of Christ. He died and the angels packed him away. And even the devil don't even know where he's buried and tried to dispute with Michael the archangel about his burial. That's what the Bible says. God took him up in the rapture. And Elijah, when he was walking down there, a prophet of God, walked down to the Jordan, took off his mantle, and struck the waters, and she parted right and left. He walked up on the mountain, Elijah said, said, what are you following me for? 
He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. He said, you've asked a hard thing, but if you see me when I go. He kept his eyes on him. And after a while, down from the heaven come a chariot of fire. And angels of fire. And horses of fire. Right. And Elijah stepped on him and went up into glory. He never tasted death. He was translated. Amen. He's got to die. And if you watch these two prophets of Revelation 11, they do the very same thing that Moses and Elijah done. You say, Brother Branham, do you mean to tell me that Elijah and Moses is still alive? Absolutely. Why, before Mount Transfiguration, Mount Transfiguration, before Jesus went to Calvary, there stood both Moses and Elijah standing there talking to him. Amen. Certainly they did. They're not dead. And they've never died. They're mortals. They've got to die. So they're just in a glorified state waiting for that time. And then, when they come back and preach exactly three and a half years under the anointing of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, while the blessings are taken from the Gentiles and the church is taken up and the coal farm or church is hunted down like dogs by the communist and Roman parties. And when they're hunted down and killed, they, they're killed. Then these prophets preach three and a half years and the Bible said that they were killed in the great, in the streets of called spiritually Sodom and Egypt where our Lord was crucified. That's back in Jerusalem. Amen. See, back in Jerusalem, spiritually called. And they laid on the streets for three days and nights. And then at the end of the three and a half days, the spirit of life coming to them and they rose up. They had to die like other mortals. They had to do it. And when they killed these two preachers, they preached against the wrong. And they brought fire out of heaven. Who did that? They, they brought plagues out of heaven. They smote the earth as quick as uh, any time they wanted to. And they brought fire out of heaven and they stopped the heavens from raining as long as they wanted to. Who was that? Exactly Moses and Elijah. There's them two witnesses. And when they tormented the church or the world by their preaching and receiving back the Jews and bringing them back to repentance, bring them back to believe on. When they see Jesus coming for the bride, they'll say, Lo, this is our God who we waited on. Amen. That's Him. But He's not coming for them. He come for His bride. Amen. And His bride, when Joseph went into Egypt, He did not take His brethren with Him. Amen. But He got His bride there. Blessed Absolutely. Amen. But when He made Himself known to His brethren, there was nobody present. That's exactly right. And when he makes himself known to these Jews, there will be nobody there but the Jews. Amen. There's them who killed Joseph. Stand there and he said, well, I'm Joseph, your brother. And he wept and they said, now we know we're in for it. Because we killed him the same thing those Jews will have. That great time of trouble just before the coming now, that persecution running them back into the homeland. It shoot them like a bunch of sheep back to Mount Carmel on earth. When the Lord Jesus shall come for his brother. And they see him, they'll say, that's the one we've waited on. There he is. He'll rise with healing in his wings. That's right. And the church, the rim of the Jews, when they finally kill these two prophets, and they lay in the street spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified, they send gifts one to another the world does. Now, Brother Palmer, here you are. Look back into the Roman history. And you'll find out there's only one nation in all the world ever sent gifts after a battle. That's the Roman Empire. That's the reason I say that the Antichrist comes out of Rome. The beast comes out of Rome. It can't come out of Moscow. It comes from Rome. The red dragon is stood the woman to devour a child as soon as it was born. That devil, where was that devil? Who was it? Caesar Augusta. That sent forth and killed all the children from two year old down. The red dragon, the dragon beast means power. The Roman power persecuted and tried to find that Christ child in that same thing. Every time that the Romans, the old pagan Romans used to have a great victory, they'd send white stones and everything to one another as gifts like that, as memorial. So those stones that was what it was, was little gifts sent between the Roman church. Absolutely, exactly. It's got to be. I've stood right there in the Vatican City and dearly fight it with the Bible. Pope wearing a triple crown. Vicarious affiliadilia. All those things which I've heard and so forth is absolutely the truth. A religious group that governs every nation under the heavens. And it does. 
Amen. There it is. It's so nothing gets Catholic people. No, sir. They're just as good as anybody else. But their religion is wrong. According to this Bible, this Bible's right. They're wrong. They say they don't. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. It's what the church says. We believe that the Bible speaks with the supreme authority. Amen. Absolutely. It's God's word. So, you see there, these stones that were sent then of Revelation here is the, the stones that were gifts sent one to another, which only goes to show the Bible said the Revelation here said, let him that has wisdom count the numbers of the beast. Let him that has wisdom do so and so. Let he that has the spirit of certain gifts do so and so. You see how short the church is? A young man asked me this morning about spiritual gifts, about speaking with tongues. A young fellow, very sincere, I believe it's to be a minister some of these days. And about the church, I said, there's so much of it is flesh. We don't want that. But we want the real thing. We long to have it. You can't go to teach in the church the first thing you know, you get one's got a tongue, one's got a psalm, then you have to battle the thing out. But when God has given a gift solidly, it'll manifest itself. Amen. That's right. See, Amen. that's the gifts of God. Amen. That's what he sends to the church for overcoming. Now the Antichrist has something like pro and con. It has the, the, the perverted way of doing it. And that's the Roman Empire, which sends gifts one to another, natural gifts. Amen. God sends spiritual gifts to overcomers. Amen. The Romans send natural gifts to one another. We believe the Holy Ghost is a spirit. We receive it by baptism and it comes from on high. The Catholic Church teaches the Holy Eucharist, which is the body of Christ, that when you receive this bread and kosher, it is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Eucharist. See? We believe it's a piece of bread. We don't believe it is the body of Christ. We're fixing to take in a few minutes. We believe it represents the body of Christ. But it isn't. That's the difference between Catholic and Protestant doctrine. See? The Catholic Church says the body is the bread is the literal body. The church has the power to transform this. Did you ever see a Catholic pass in the church, bow his head, make crosses? Because that little light's burning in the church there, under that little oh, tabernacle. It's got a light in there, and that kosher bread lays in there, and that's the body of Christ. And when you take that, you're absolutely taking the literal body of Christ on your first communion and your confessions and so forth. You're taking literally the body of Christ. We say that it represents the body of Christ. Amen. See, that is nothing in the world but a piece of bread. And no matter if it wasn't even bread, if it was anything else, it would represent just the same. Just, just exactly. Whether you, like people say, I wouldn't be baptized in a pool, I wouldn't be baptized in a river. What difference does it make as long as you're baptized? It's in a pool, and while well, Philip was baptized in a pool, when the eunuch uh, was ba- baptized, when Philip baptized the eunuch in the pool, the Holy Spirit wrapped him so much that he caught Philip away and he wasn't seen for 200 miles. Caught him in the spirit. Give him a, a chariot right out of heaven for 200 miles. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Now, where will the saints be after the 1,000 years reign? And what kind of a body will they have? I'll get back to that in a moment. They'll be with Jesus. All right. Se- uh, seventh question. How shall we judge angels? That's found. And uh, how shall we judge angels? By being sons and daughters of God. Man. Angels are servants. We are sons and daughters of God. And the Bible said that we'll judge angels. That's right. Now, now if you... Uh, uh, the eighth question. Why hair because of angels? Uh, 1 Corinthians. Now, somebody give me 1 Corinthians, uh, the uh, 11th chapter... And we'll uh, see there that you'll find out um, that the, the, in 1 Corinthians uh, the 11, we find out that Paul is speaking. Let me get over to it just a minute, and then we'll read it right quick, and then we'll, we'll have it down. I've got something to say on this other verse here that I hope the Lord gives it to us the way we should have it. If somebody find I think that's the 11th chapter. Yeah. All right. Now listen clo- real close now so that you'll understand. Now take all your conscience. And put it in your best pocket after I read this. <laughs> Listen real close. This is, thus saith the Lord. Be followers of me, even as I am of Christ. Paul said, you follow me, just as I follow Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keeping of the ordinances as I delivered unto you. 
But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. See how it is? God, Christ, man, woman. Now, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors Christ. But every woman praying or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Now, we get this minute to show you that the hair to the woman is her covering. For that even all, one as if she was shaven. That means if, if she's going to cut her hair, then shave it off. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Shorn means shaven, see? But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now we're getting right down to the question you're asking. See? All right. Now it is wrong for a, a lady to cut her hair, according to the Bible. Now you listen right here and see if the Bible don't give a man a legal right to put away his wife if she cuts her hair. See if this is right or not. If a man, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, that's have long hair, for so much as he is in the image and the glory of God, but the woman is in the glory of the man. Did you ever think of that? Now, I want to stop here because I want this to soak in real good, see. And I remember, I've seen tens of thousands of lovely women, know them right now, plenty of them sitting in this church, that has short hair, that's Christians, and what I laid on to is not you, it's the way you've been taught, see. And that's it. Your preacher never told you this. But if any of the women around a tabernacle like that, then they're guilty, see. Because we sure tell them about it. Now, <clears throat> now watch this. A man, for seventh verse, for a man. Now, who's speaking here? Uh, sometimes a lady say, oh, Paul was an old woman hater. Well, now, while we're at that, let's just turn over here to Galatians 1.8 and see what Paul says about this, see. In Galatians 1.8, you'll find out that Paul said here in Galatians 1.8, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel in this you've already heard, let it be accursed. Now, don't blame me, you blame him, see. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for so much as he is in the glory and the image of God. But the woman is in the glory and the image of man. Now, watch the next verse. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Neither was the man created for a woman, but the woman was cre created for a man. Now, I mean this now with real love and sweetness. And I hope you understand the same way. I say this. But America, as an international traveler, America has some of the most low-down, degraded rules for their women of any nation in the world. Paris, France could be a sky-high scraper up the side of the way America lets their women do. It's a disgrace. Did you realize that the God of America is woman? I can prove that to you by this Bible. That's right. Do you realize it has to come that way so the Catholic Church can bring in their doctrine of the Virgin Mary? Now, if a woman was made not for a man, now if a man was not made for a woman, but a woman made for a man, then how are you going to worship a woman? See? Now, what did it? It started in Paris and landed in Hollywood. Now, Paris has to come to Hollywood to get their models and get their fashions and things. It's the degrading of our American women. What is it? Our nation has come so little until they've even taken the jobs away from the man and put women out here in these places till 90% of them nearly are prostitutes. And talk about men being gone shorts because they got women out there in their jobs. And got so low down till they put women as peace officers on the street. That's a disgrace to any nation. Yes, sir. What are you going to do about it? What do you do about it, Brother Bram? I have to respect it. I'm an American citizen. I do what the big boss says. If I ever, if a, if a family ever loses its respect for the family, the children lose their respect for the parents, that family's tore to pieces. If a, if a church ever loses respect of its pastor, well, that church is gone. And if a nation ever loses their respect of the Supreme Court and its decision, that nation is gone to pieces. That's exactly right. We've got to respect those things because they're the big boss. See? But it isn't right in the beginning. 
Absolutely. Did you know that a man in the Bible of Genesis, the first chapter, when God created woman and, and man and made a, the man and woman and God told Eve that your husband will rule over you, be your ruler? Speak that in America and see where you'll get. Boy, it's not that the woman rules over the man. They have to do that. The public places are set up. I could bring women if I had to from my room there by the dozens of decent women. I don't say all women shouldn't well, sometimes have to work. Maybe they've got a sick husband or something, they have to work. But if they don't have to, they shouldn't do it. Their place is at home, their little castle. That's exactly where they should be. And our American women have been privileged to go and eat hog or die. Even in all animals and so forth. When that thing prevails, it takes place and it degrades the whole race of it. There's a little bird in Africa, and she's a little pick bird. Now, usually, the female is always the ugliest of the two. The male is always the most beautiful. The male deer, the male elk, the male pheasant, the, the male chicken, and always is the most, because the female is the home bird. She sits on the nest, she raises her little one. She's disguised in the hawk, the snake, the coyote, whatever more. See? To raise your little one. But in the race word that the, or in the sex that the, the woman or the female prevails in beauty, it's always a degrading type. In Africa, you take a bird. There's a little bird there, and the only one on this continent that I know of, that the female is more prettier than the male. And when it does, that, girl, that bird is a constant prostitute. She'll run around and find a mate and run out and lay in a bunch of eggs that she's made with that and let the mate set on the eggs while she goes and hunts another mate. That's exactly right. See? See what I mean? It, now look, in America today, of our women, a young man from Kentucky told me a few days ago that there was 800 women working at a certain plant here in Kentucky. And he said, I could possibly feel safely and swearing that 400 of them is absolutely street prostitutes and married women with children. One guy took his wife out there and worked her up with a board and then he liked to kill her and another one you know, to shoot a man and another one cutting and fighting. That shouldn't be. That's not right. Put the woman back in the kitchen where she belongs and everything will be all right. But you put her out there in public work, she's gone. Absolutely. I don't say that the American women snigger up their nose and say there's nothing to that and you show me. Certainly you've got to do it because the Bible predicted you would do it. You have to do it. And here when it used to be a long time ago in the Methodist church, if a woman cut her hair, she's put out of the church. Certainly did. Yes, indeed. Nazarene, Pilgrim, Holiness, Pentecostals, all of them used to do it. What happened? You know why? You got some sissies behind the pulpit. That's exactly right. Somebody's afraid their meal tickets, afraid you'd excommunicate and run them out of the church. They didn't have the very adopted to stand and stand on God's word, whether it hurt or whether it didn't. That's exactly right. Listen here, a man is the ruler. Don't you think you rule the house? You're not the ruler of the house. You're absolutely, you're not a slave now, but you're a helpmate. And Adam, the man has the rule over his wife and he's responsible solely for his wife. God makes a man answer for his wife. Now, read as if God says that now. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for so much as he is in the image and the glory of God. God is not a woman, God's a man. You know when they make Virgin Mary and all that in inter uh, intercessions and everything like that and pray to Virgin Mary? You know what it reminds me of? The great goddess Diana, who Paul rebuked and run out. Amen. That's right. He said, well, God ain't no woman. A rock fell out in the field, and they said the goddess stole down their image. That's the reason the women at Corinth and up and there the, at worship Diana, they wanted to become preachers. They said, well, the Spirit told us we could preach. He said, what came the word of God out of you and came it from you only? If any man thinks himself to be spiritual or prophet, let him acknowledge what I say is the commandments of the Lord. Let a woman keep silent and be under subjections in the church, not the teacher to have any authority. That's exactly That's what the Scripture says. See, and God's going to make a bunch of preachers answer for that at the day of judgment. But listen, you say, well, I tell you, I was taught that. You know better now. Amen. That's right. If you're somebody, you start taking a dose of medicine, somebody tells you it's arsenic, and you, and you go ahead and take it anyhow, that's your own fault after that. See? Now, listen to this. 
For the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. For this cause ought a woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Any of you read it? First Corinthians 11 chapter and the 10th verse. If you notice, power why of the angels. First Corinthians, because the angels is the man, the messenger. Look, it's a little A again. Where angels are concerned of heavenly angels, it's a big A, capital A. Where it's a little A, it's man, angel. Nevertheless, neither is there man or woman, neither is the woman without the man, the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. All things are of God. Judge yourself. Is it commonly for a woman to pray to God with short hair, uncovered? Think of it now. I watch does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, say what did it pertain to? Hair. Don't you see what Paul's talking about? Hair. Long hair. If the woman ought to have long hair. 14th verse now. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame to him? You get it? It's a shame for a man to have long hair, but that's a woman's place. God made a man different from a woman, sex and in looks. And in everything else, she ought to wear a garment. The Bible said that if a woman will put on a pair of slacks or any garment that pertains to a man, it's an abominable and dirty and filthy sight in the front of God. And God will make her pay for it. Who are you going to listen to? This is the Bible. And you run around and say, well, I think it's nice for see women wear slacks, but the, God made them different. He wants them dressed different. And the Bible said if a woman will even put on a garment that pertains to a man... It's an abomination. You know what abomination is? It's something that's filthy in the sight of God. And the great Jehovah who looks down upon you as being a filthy thing. And the Bible said, and you said so some of you ladies now, to your young girls around in a teenage, 18, 20 years old, letting her run out of your dress like she is. And you too, Mama. See, when you go out and wear those slacks and things and live, get on the street and, and have those old clothes that they're making nowadays and make you look like something that you're not. See? And you go out there on the street all sexily looking. You might be just as innocent and pure before your husband and everything. But if you go out on the street and a man looks upon you because you present yourself like that, you're guilty and going to answer at the day of judgment for committing adultery with every man that looked at you like that. That's what the Bible said. The Bible said, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart already, and you're guilty. And will. you come to the judgment and say, Lord, you know my heart. I never committed adultery. I live true to my husband. But here will be a man. Here will be another. Here another. 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 15, 20, 30, 40 of them standing there saying, Guilty of adultery. Why? Some man looked up on you. Well, I had nothing to do it. Well, why'd you present yourself like that for? When God told you not to put them on, it's an abomination to do it. And you go listen to Who Loves Susie or what's that? Did you find out what's taking place with that? Who Loves Susie's Husband? You all seen that here recently in the paper. When we was out in the Casper, Wyoming, come out. What's his name, that guy that on that, we love Susie, or what What the world is that? The, oh, what y'all stay there on Wednesday night and miss prayer meeting to see? What is that now? Um, we love, what is the name of that? I love Lucy. Her husband's supposed to be surrounded, has been caught out yonder at Reno, Nevada with a colored girl who's been living with her for years. And that's what you stay home to see instead of going here in the gospel. The woman confessed it. Oh, mercy. There's nothing clean outside of Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless your heart, brother. I, I tell you, you got some of the, you say, oh my, look at the class. Some of the, the very worst vultures we got, the scavengers are pretty birds. You can't judge a bird by its feathers. See? So just remember that. Oh my. Now watch. Does not even nature, that's the 14th verse, teach you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair that belongs to a woman. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. Now, what's he talking about? A hat that you Catholic people wear in church? No, indeed. A little covering over top of your head, a handkerchief? He's talking about your hair. Now, and if a woman cuts off her hair, she cuts off her glory and is not permitted to the altar to pray. You just want to say, here, isn't it a common thing for a woman to go pray with a head uncovered? So if she says, well, she got to cut her hair so let her be shaved off slick then. If she's going to be shaved off slick, so that's a dishonor. It's a shame for a woman to do that. Then said she ought to be covered. 
I, I miss I miss reading Paul's letter. You all, it's up to you. See, but if the woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Did it say she be given a hat? You Catholic people, or you Protestants? Either one that goes to church wants to wear a hat. See, well, I'm going to church. You ought to put on a hat. No, you ought to let your hair grow. That's the difference. See. For her hair is given to her for a covering, and it's a shame for her to come in church without covered. Go to the altar to pray. But if a man seem to be, uh, to be, uh, I don't believe I can pronounce that word, C O N T A, contentious, con- contentious, you know what contentious is. Uh, we have no such custom, neither the church of God. Now, if you want to argue about it, you argue with that. <laughs> All right. Do you want to be contentious? Now, oh, it don't make any difference. Let's let it go ahead. Well, I think it's nothing. It's not what the hair is anyhow. It's what the heart is. That's true. The heart tries. The hair will be right. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. You want to be contentious, Paul said. We have no such custom neither in the church of God. So if you want to belong to Cain's side, we'll just go ahead. But this is my thought. Oh, I don't mean to laugh because it's not a laughing matter. But I tell you, friends, it's a shame to see the way that these things have been permitted to do. I, listen, to you, my dear sisters, I want you to look your best and be your best. That's what you ought to be. That's what you ought to be. And you ought to be as sweet and fresh and everything as you can when your husband comes, just the same as that was your sweetheart. And you ought to meet him at the door with, the, with just as the kiss is sweet to him as it was the day you kissed him at the altar to be your husband. That's right. I don't blame you for looking your best and being your best. And I want you to be that way. God knows I do. Here some time ago, I was talking to Jack Shuler. Who ever heard of Jack Shuler? Amen. Most famous preacher of the Methodist has got. He said a woman come and said, hair all dirty and chewing, chewing gum, and her clothes half on. said, you know, my husband won't even put up with me anymore. He said, I don't blame him. <laughs> That's right. Now, but what you've got to do, you've got to be in the right way. Don't take your freshness and beauty out of Hollywood. Take it out of the Bible before God. Be a lady. Act like a lady. Dress like a lady. Be clean. Act like a lady. Don't wear those. Any man that lets his wife get out and wear those little old things before man and them little old uh, things get out and lawn mow the yard and things like that. Mister, I'm telling you, brother, I don't, I don't mean to be mean. I, I, God knows that. That's my heart. But I, uh, I'm going to have to change a whole lot before I let mine do it. I'm going to be boss up on the hill up there as long as I can, you see. And when I can, I'm going to move off. <laughs> That's right. Oh, brother, that's a shame and a disgrace for women to do that. And I don't mean sister. I'm not degrading you. I'm just trying to say our church has no members. People just come here. But this is a house of God. And we absolutely tell people not to wear those things that it's your go to answer for it at the day of judgment. Now, watch it and let your hair grow out, see, and be a lady. Now, now in this that is I declare unto you, I praise you not for that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there are uh, divisions among you and so forth. It goes on now to the communion table. Now, listen to that. That's why that the angels, now Brother Palmer, I ain't telling you on this tape, do you preach the same thing that I heard I'm doing here? But you know very well that you being a preacher, you know that's the truth, brother. All right, so the angels here are the man. If you notice, Brother Palmer, it's in the little letter. The angels in the Bible goes ahead. He's talking about the man and his wife. See, that's what the subject is. That's why people get so confused in the Bible. They say, well, God says one thing here and one... No, you, you get off the subject. Stay right on the same subject, that's all. He's talking about man and wife. Now, one more thing I want to hit just before we close. It'll take me about two minutes. Where will the saints be after the 1,000 years reign, and what kind of a body will they have? I think that's the sweetest question. I just love that. Now, let's look right straight into it. In the beginning, God, we'll go back to our Hebrew teaching just for a few minutes, God was this great big fountain of seven colors. How many knows that, see? And how many knows that God has seven spirits? Absolutely, seven spirits. There were seven eyes in the Lamb, and so forth. All that coming together now, see? Now, that was God. Now, when he, the Logos went out of God, which was God coming from this one big fountain into a body in the form of a, of a man. And it made the Logos, which we call theosomy. Now, 
if you take the Theosophists, when you are looking at that, that's a man. Now, that we, now, that's where we were in the beginning. Now, you do not understand it now, but you was back there in the beginning that way. When, man made, when God made man in his image, he made him a theostomy. And he only placed him in flesh when God made man in his image and his likeness. They were in Genesis 2, there were, or Genesis 1, 28, I believe it is. There was no man yet to till the soil, and God had done made male and female. That's right. No man to till the soil. Then God brought man a little lower down and put him in animal life. That's this body. It's like the animals. So that he could feel the sorrow, could touch. That theosophy doesn't touch. It doesn't see, taste, smell, hear these senses that we have. So God put man down there in order to, to touch and to feel it. And as he walked through the Garden of Eden, first as the theosophy, like the Holy Spirit is in here now, walking in here, it led the animal life. It controlled everything, but it couldn't kill the sorrow, see? So God put him in flesh so that he could kill the sorrow, give him his five senses to till the soil and fix up the, the vineyards and, and so forth. And then the man still looked lonesome. Oh, this is a beautiful picture. Look, for when he was first made, he was made two people together. He was made both male and female, the man was. The Bible said he was. God made man both male and female, created he him. Notice. Now, when man was separated from the theosophy and put in flesh, he, was, he wasn't just altogether there. Part of his being was still a theosophy. So it didn't look right. There went the male and female and the cow. There went the horse and there went the ox and there went everything else, pairs. But Adam, it was, see, there was something lacking. That very crave showed that there was a mate waiting for him. You get it? And the very thoughts that we have to die here, that we're troubled and perplexed, and we long for a life that has no death, it shows us waiting for us. See? And Adam was lonesome. And God, to show that they could not be separated. Now, I'm going to get back into the same thing just a second. Look, he never went and got dirt and made a Eve. But he made from the original dirt, Adam, he took a rib from his side and made him a helpmate. And that was Eve. She was made for the man and part of the man. She was part of him in the beginning of the creation, in the theosophy. She was part of him down here in this creation. She could not be divided in another creation. She had to be made in the same creation. That's exactly why Christ and God had to be the very same person. Amen. It could not be anything different. If he'd been a good man or a prophet, he wouldn't have been a redeemer. He had to be the creator himself. Amen. But he's still a theosophy now. It's the way he was then. Now, a man come down here, and he is wonderful. And God loved that. He said, that's beautiful. Let him be on earth and live there forever. That's all. For, for eternity. On and on and on. Let it just grow and ever bring, bring forth and everything like that. And let the man live and the beast live and everything else forever and ever. That's all right. See? And then sin entered. And I want to make this statement. In the, so many people make such a terrible mistake on this one scripture. And that is on the 23rd Psalm. They read it like this. Yea, though I walk through the dark valley of the shadow of death. Now there is no such a thing. The Bible doesn't say that. The dark shadow of the valley, uh, the dark valley of the shadows of death. It says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, before it can be a shadow, it has to have light to make the shadow. See, David been a prophet early on, and he didn't make a mistake. He just said the truth. Yea, though I not walk through the dark valley, but through the valley of the shadows of death. Then you have to have a certain percent of light to make a shadow. And that's the way it is here. We are both Natural and supernatural. This body is subject to death and was brought forth by a woman. Not by nothing but to, not by God. You're a reproduction from Adam and Eve. Be black, white, whatever you are. You are a production, an offspring from Adam and Eve. 
That makes your body, born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. You're damned and condemned at the beginning of your life. Not even without a chance. Now, because the spirit that you have come to you by nature and by nature coming from sexual intercourse, desire by man and woman produces our earthly child. And let that child alone and don't teach him nothing right, he'll go wrong. Don't teach him neither right nor wrong, he'll take wrong. Because it's his nature to do so. Watch a little old baby, not over high hand. Just get so mad at his and wring his hands and turn red in the face and hold his breath. Yeah. Sure. Amen. What is it? It's his nature. He got it from his pappy. Here's mammy one. She had a temper to fight above saw or his daddy. But his grandfather or grandmother did. See, it's offspring. So that makes you born in the world. You come by nature and your whole being is black and smutty and damned and cursed and going to hell. Amen. Right. But when you're born again, Amen. then the light of God shines down into that soul. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. There's no more dark valley, but it's a valley with a shadow in it. Amen. You may be veiled here with the flesh and the things over our face, but there's enough light in there, and someday that light and darkness has to separate. Amen. And when the light shines, darkness flees. Amen. And when we go to be with Christ in that body, darkness and death vanishes, and we burst out into Amen. perfect light. Amen. Glory to God. There we are. No more sickness. No more dark mixed with it. Right now we have both sickness and joy and have health and strength and we have ins and outs and ups and downs and joy and sorrow and so forth. What is this? It's a shadow. Amen. We got enough light to know that there's light there and we're still in the body and flesh. But someday, the day's going to break. Amen. That's when the death angel sets at the foot of the bed. Amen. That's when the doctor says it's all finished. And this natural comes away from the supernatural and the light springs back to light and darkness goes back to darkness. Amen. Then this mortal puts on immortality. Amen. That's when this corruption puts on incorruption. That's when this mortal puts on immortality and we become from a creature of time to a creature of eternity. Oh, you cannot go out there with total darkness. You've got to have light in the darkness. Amen. There you are. That's that body you receive. What do we do? Well, my dear sainted brother, my dear sainted sister, before the foundation of the world, when God created you in His image, or created the, the man in His image, and created the woman in the image of the man for the glory of the man, He made you a theostomy. Just like He said when He said, Let us. To the creatures that he had made. Let us make man in our own image, in our likeness. A theosophy. God had never become flesh yet. He was in a theosophy. And Moses saw him. Moses cried, Lord, let me see you. He said, go yonder and hide in the rock. In the cleft. And Moses got back in that cleft. And when God passed by the lightning and thunders, and when God passed by, he had his back turned like this. And Moses said it was the back of a man. Amen. Hallelujah. Who was it? The Melchizedek had come down the king of Salem with no father and mother, no beginning of days or ending of life. That's him. And he come down. That's when I talked to Abraham. They gathered him up on a little body of flesh like that, breathe into it, step into it, and come down and eat a calf. Amen. Drink milk from a cow and eat some butter and some cornbread. Amen. And the two angels. And when he walked out there and all of that stuff just vanished and went away. I never thought of that here some time ago, loading a rifle shell. I had a 22 rifle, it's 220 Swift. And you rifle and brother in here know. A little bullet, it's a 48 grain bullet, just about that long, regular 22 bullet. It's loaded almost on a chamber powder, a 30 odd six. Now, I, the factory only loads that to about 4,400 feet per second. All right? But you can put it up, load it yourself, and you can put it up to 5,000 feet per second. And, and otherwise, if you were shooting, we were shooting the other day at 200 yards, and the bullet would hit in the dust and fire before the gun would ever echo. That's how fast it is. Then you take a toothpick, 
You know, a flat pour on toothpick. Reach down your powder and get that thing full of powder, just about four or five little grains, and lay it on top there, and then put your bullet in there. Stand here, and you've got a bullet in your hand this second. And shoot it out there at the groundhog sitting 200 feet from you, and the groundhog never even moves. The bullet turns back to its original conditions, back to gases. Here's a bullet that's copper and lead mixed together, and one split second, it's back to you never find it again. It went back like it was a hundred billion years ago. Ah. Back to gases, those gases have to form and come back into copper and into lead and so forth like that. Those gases have to settle. Now, there you are. That's the way we are here. We come from a higher being. In the beginning, we were in the image of God. The veil and the darkness keeps us from knowing it now. But Jesus told his disciples he is with them before the foundation of the world. Amen. See? We were. You can't know it now, but you was in the beginning. Amen. And if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have one already waiting. Amen. Hallelujah. And then we move into this theosophy, what we once lived so we could eat and shake hands. And the soul learned the altar cried, how long, Lord? These seven steps that goes to God for the seven spirits as it comes down. All right, as you go under the altar of God, they was crying, Lord, how long can we go back down here? God said, just for a little season until your fellow man suffer the same thing that you've suffered. See? And then the souls return back and they become man and women again and live forever when all the darkness and death and sickness and sorrow of the blackness that faded out. There's no more shadow. It's absolutely sunlight. Amen. Listen, here's what. Let it get as dark as it wants to get. It cannot get too dark until the sun will smash every bit of the darkness. Amen. Darkness and light cannot dwell long together. For the which is the most powerful? is the light. And when the light shines, darkness flees. Amen. Aren't you glad? Aren't you happy that you know? No doubt. There's not a shadow nowhere. But this blessed light that's in our hearts right now, something testifying back. The Son of God. The power of God. And we walk here. Watch the power of the Holy Spirit come down and go out into a meeting and say, You was Mrs. So-and-so that you did a certain thing at a certain place. You've been plagued with this so long. But thus saith the Lord, stand to your feet, you're healed. And a cripple and blind rise to their feet. And a shadow of a man eaten up with cancer rise to life and new health again. Amen. There's no doubt. Jesus said, these things that I do shall you all. So he said, I do nothing till the Father shows me. What is that? That's the light that's come mixing into this darkness, you see. Amen. The Redeemer. Get what I mean? Now, someday it goes right back to there, and then when the theosomy becomes immortal flesh again like it was in the beginning, then Jesus comes, and God, when Christ will be one, Christ will sit on the throne, and all the people will be human. Christ will be on the throne of David, a man, the Lord Jesus, never to die, never will we die, never will we be sick, have no more sorrow, and we will live through the thousand years and when a thousand years are expired on this earth, then the devil comes up and the second resurrection comes, the resurrection of the unjust. They gather a great army like the sands of the sea. And they come up to compass the camp of the saints. And when it does, God brings fire and brimstone out of the heavens and destroys them. And John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. For the first heaven and the first earth was passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adored for her husband. There you are. There he said, the wife, the lamb, and the bride will be there forever. There will be a new earth. Amen. Millions and millions of square miles. Amen. Oh, my. The city. The Bible measures out the city of 15,000 square miles. It's 15,000 miles long, 15,000 miles wide, and 15,000 miles high. That's exactly the description the Bible gives of the city. No one is no more sea. <laughs> there was no place for it. Oh, there will be such beauty. And in there, there's a fountain right at the throne of God that flows before the throne. There's a tree on either side of the tree, of the river of life. And in this tree dwells twelve men of fruit and yields its fruit every month. Amen. There's a twenty and four elders.
There's the bride. There's the 44,000 the temple unit. Oh, brother, we're going somewhere. Amen. Things lay ahead for us. The four, uh, 20 and 4 elders, the 144,000 unit, the bride sitting with Christ. Amen. <laughs> My home sweet home. Amen. Amen. The faith that I had the privilege of going there and you had the privilege of going there. Amen. And why would you choose to walk in this darkness and see no light and die and go into chaos and become nothing? For when light takes its supreme authority, there's no place for darkness. Go find where the darkness went when light comes. That's when it is when all things are turned back to God. It had, darkness had a beginning. Darkness has an end. Light never had a beginning or never has an end. God never had a beginning or never has an end. So someday the whole debauch world with all of its sin and its beauty so called and all of its fantastics and sensations and all of its glamour and everything will fade out into nothing and it'll be no more. Amen. It'll be no more. No more thought of. It's that even it won't even come into the remembrance anymore. But the blessed of the Lord shall always be with him. We'll have a body like his own glorious body and live with him and eat with him and sit with him and dwell Amen. with him forever and forever and for the aeons of time and the eternal ages to roll on with world without him. And you have a choice tonight. If you're not prepared to meet that place, no matter how much you go to church, how good a member you are, you're lost until Christ has given you new life in that darkness that you walk in. You may be religious. Religious, listen friends, religion is intellectual. See, all the Cain's children always had religion. Those Jews had religion when Jesus came, but they rejected salvation. You may be very religious tonight. You may be Presbyterian, Methodist, Pentecostal, Nazarene, Pilgrim, Holiness. You may be just as religion. Go to your church and testify. You may sing and shout and praise the Lord. You may bring your tithe to the church. You may treat your neighbor right. That doesn't have one thing to do with your eternal destination. Amen. Cain did every bit of that. Absolutely. Amen. The Bible said that the wheat and carriers come together. The little wheat says it's starving for rain. And the, uh, the briars is too. When the rain comes, the briars are just as happy to get the rain as the wheat is. But by their fruits, you shall know them. Now let us pray while you examine your fruits. Now, Father God, there's been some stiff questions here tonight. I may not have done the right thing, but the best of my knowledge, you know my heart. I pray, God, that you'll receive it. And now maybe in some of these questions, if I haven't made them right, then you speak to the people's heart. And you make them just where they should be. I feel that you told me, but if I could be wrong, then you forgive me. And I pray, God, that each one of these will take these things in their heart and may they ponder over them and think like this. Yes, there is the church. There is these things. That's what the Bible said. Maybe the ladies, Lord, you know I didn't mean anything personal but telling them. But God, I, I love my sisters and you know that, Father. You know how I think of them. But to stand and tell them something wrong, I'd be a, a deceiver to them. I do not wish to be a deceiver to my sisters. I want to tell them the truth. And Father, I take it right from your word. And I don't condemn my brethren, but Lord, I say that they've been wrong when they permit these things. And if the lady no different and went and done it, then it's up to her. The pastor's not guilty. That, but Father, those things are your word and they're to you. Now you speak to the hearts of the people. I commit them all to you. I'll see what you've done, Father. You know, speak to each heart. We ask in Christ's name and with our heads bowed, I wonder if someone would raise their hand and say, Brother Bram, just remember me that I can be a complete overcomer and as the last day wear the wedding garment and be with Christ. Would you raise your hand and say, pray for me. Everybody keep your head down. I just bow. God bless you. That's fine. God bless you, my sisters and my brothers too. Raising your hands. That's wonderful. Now, Father, you see their hands. I know sometimes you think, well, just a little prayer like that. God, I'm thinking about that mother who said yesterday, just a little prayer there in her house that day when that boy was dying. Three weeks to live, that malignancy on the brain, and now the change thing. I think of Hezekiah leaning his face towards the wall and crying, Lord, I beseech you to be merciful to me. Consider me for a walk before you with a perfect heart. It changed from death to life. One scream from the Son of God, Lazarus, come forth, and a dead man came forth. Oh, God. You said, speak, ask, and it shall be given. When you say anything, believe that what you say comes to pass, you'll have what you say. Now, Father, I pray that each that raise their hands will receive what they raise their hands for. May they be blessed 
And God, I pray that you'll help our sisters, that they'll be, let them conduct themselves, that Satan through television and True Story magazines and so forth, that's been so loosely handled, and uncensored programs, how the dirt and vulgar on the televisions and so forth, which would, could be an instrument to win millions of souls to you, but how they're not censored and put out all these old the dirty things that they oh how pitiful and to know that the spirit of the devil has got in around our sisters and tried to make them fashion and dress like that and we find out that in the in our brothers also Lord that how they figure that they can smoke and drink and carry on like that and still be Christians because they say they believe let them know that the devil believes also and he is not saved he believes and trembles and now Father we pray that you'll be merciful to us all and forgive us of our sins. And maybe some didn't raise up their hands. Oh, God, be merciful. May the next opportunity they have, may they raise their hands. We're fixing to take the communion, Lord. Forgive us of our trespasses and our bygones of life. And may we receive of thy blessing. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. I'm sorry to keep you like this. I just wonder, just before communion, if there's anyone come to be prayed for, would want to be prayed for, I would be glad to do that just at this time. If there's anybody to be prayed for. All right, brother. You bring her right on up. That'll be fine. Uh, just a moment. And then we're going, to, we're going to dismiss. And then when we dismiss, then those who want to stay for the communion can stay. But right now, we're going to offer prayer for the sick. Amen. What did the Bible say? If the brother can't raise up, that's all right. Just let him sit there. We'll come to him. That's all right. Just let him sit right there. We'll come down and pray for him. It's okay. All right, sir. Just let, uh, let him sit right there. It's hard for him to stand here. Well, we'd be glad to come right to him. Now I want to make this one little mention, my dear friends. See, I, I know that the Lord has proved this over and over so many times. See, I'm not a, much of a preacher. I have not education and so forth. I love the Lord Jesus. God knows that. I love Him. But one thing I was called to do, pray for the sick. Do you believe that? Uh, even before I ever knowed about the gift, I used to cry here at the hospital. And I remember that nurse would say, now you're going to get well. See, is this something that God has been so gracious to honor my prayers for the people? I imagine tonight, if it would be called just a whole worldwide blast to everywhere in the world. And say, everybody, uh, Brother Bram has prayed for, come here, I'd like for you to give an answer to the United States government with a letter. And that would be a worldwide broadcast, I guess, Maybe four or five million people would answer that call if it was known. See? Yeah. And then people, or some of them, were already been dead, laid out by the doctors and, and the undertakers. Some of them have been killed in accidents. Some of them died natural death. Some of them are blind, halt, lame, twisted, afflicted, mentally in hospitals, didn't even always in the hospital to pray for them, bring them in, have taken to fight their way through and cut themselves to pieces, not even know where's that, in a five minutes be normal, sweet, loving people and the same the rest of their day, you see. It's what is it? It's not Brother Branham. It's Jesus Christ. He sent me to pray for the sick. Now, here's what it is. It's not been too successful in Jeffersonville because here's why. Now, I want you to know, I got some of my closest and best friends is right here in this city. Although the city itself, to say the city, I do not like it. I do not like this situation. Never did. When I was a little boy, I sat and read my history books. I said, someday I'll leave here. See? I don't like Jeffersonville. It's a swamp. It's down in here. It's just a real swampy, and, and it's very bad. Go up here on top of Spickert Knobs somewhere and look off down towards New Albany, Jeffersonville, if you want to see. Look here. The doctor's even saying now that the people of this valley is becoming anemia because of the conditions. A little lady up here, Mrs. Morgan, has healed cancer. Took her dog out here at the clinic. Thought it had mange. You know what it was? The settlings of Colgate's and things on the weeds where it went through. It's the most unhealthy place. A fellow was in the army, went down here, got, had asthma, went down here in Florida, and his eyes become real black. And he went over to the doctor, and he said, Doctor, the doctor said, now you've been to fight, haven't you? He said, no, sir, I haven't. If you don't know who it is, his name is Herbie, I forget his name, it's, it's the Union National Bank in New Albany. He's a teller. Just go there and see the one that says Herbie, asked him. And he said, he, went, he said, Doctor, he said, I've got sinus. He examined He said, that's right. He said, I thought you'd been in a fight. He said, boy, where do you live? He said, you might not know the place that I live in a little city across from Louisville, Kentucky, called New Albany, Indiana. He said, you mean to tell me that you've taken sinus trouble for all this salt water here in Miami from coming? He said, if you can live in Jeffersonville, Indiana, or New Albany, Indiana, you can live anywhere in the world in the United States Army and send you. That's all. See, it's the most unhealthy place there is in the world that I know of, unless it be in some malaria swamp. See, and I, 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 I've got friends here. Look here. I can just go to call them like this. Look at Dr. Sam Adair. 
my buddy. All right, there's Mike Egan sitting there. Oh, my, how many could I name? Just hundreds of real good buddies, my old chums that have chums. No matter how many new friends I find, there's nothing will take a place of an old buddy. You know that. There's my old mother sitting back there. Not many days for the earth. She's in her 60s now. There's my wife's mother, 70, going on 71, sitting back here somewhere, I think, tonight. And there, leave her. My daddy's buried up here. The wife buried out here on the Walnut Ridge. My baby laying out there. See what I mean? I, I, I don't like, I, I, I don't want to stay here. And I believe that soon, right away, I'm going to have to leave. See, because it's been coming to me. I say this over to the pulpit in my Bible constantly. When I told my wife and they give us the money to build that parsonage, which I turned over to this church. This church owns that parsonage. Go out here and find out if it isn't. See, I wouldn't take it myself. Now, when I was going to build that meeting, he said, I want to stay here on account of my mother. I said, honey, just as sure as we do, we'll be sorry of it. See, it just won't work. God has said, separate. I've got to do it. He said, well, my mother. I said, my mother too. But he that won't forsake his own and follow after me is not worthy to be called mine. And that's true. Someday, shortly, I feel I'm going to have to move. That's a uh, go away. But here's the way the meetings won't work here. It won't work like it does anywhere else and anybody's ever been in the meeting knows that's true because it's right here in my own hometown. That's it. Jesus said the same thing when he comes. They said, who is this guy? Isn't that the carpenter's boy out here? What school did he ever go to? Where did he get this learning? Now let me see you do. You said you did miracles over here. Let me see you do the same thing here. What you doing in Capernaum? Let me see you do it here. Jesus said he marveled at their unbelief. He turned and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, a prophet's not without reward unless he's amongst his own people in his own county. Is that right? And we know. Look, look take Finney. Take Sankey. Moody. Take John Wesley. Never could make a go of it, see, until he left his country. Look at, look at, um, at, at um, um, Moody. Well, Moody, a Boston shoe cobbler, couldn't go at all. He'd come to Chicago before he come famous, see. He had to get it from his own. You always have to do it. But now here, God will answer prayer if you'll forget it's William Branham. <laughs> if you'll forget it's William Branham has anything to do with it, only just wanted to stand and pray for it. It's Jesus Christ that's already did what you've asked to do if you'll just believe it. Amen. See? It isn't anything to do. I have nothing to do with it, just a witness. But seemingly, like, after raising here with you, and you know every weakness I have and every fault I have, and you know what God has done. Right in this city. This city at the day of judgment will answer a great price someday. For there's been hundreds and hundreds of outstanding healings right here. Amen. Right. Right here. Signs and wonders and the appearing of the angel and the papers blasted forth and everything. And still people don't. Why is it? Now someday I'm going to leave here. I'm wondering what will be my end. Is it over? Is it just about? I'm 48 years old. Uh, is it just about over? I wonder this. If it is, look, why didn't the world realize that picture there? Why didn't they catch that right quick? Why don't they catch these other things? Why don't they catch these prophecies and things? You know, they can't do it now. But one day, I'm going to leave the world. And when I leave, then they'll recognize it. Some of you young people will realize that after I'm gone. See, But God wouldn't permit it to be done now. See, what, you understand what I mean. Just a little girl's bracelet. Anybody can have it. Now, I believe Brother Stoffman said that he left the Bible here the last time he shared. I believe anybody find a Bible, a uh, strange Bible along here? If you do, it belongs to Brother Fred Stoffman from Canada. Now, let us pray. Lord, be merciful. As the music is sweetly to play, and Brother Neville is to anoint with oil, I go to lay hands on the sick in the name of Jesus. Grant it, Lord, for their healing. Amen. Everybody pray.
made it possible in the midst. Amen. To say, let me think, like God said, these signs shall fall in the midst of the day. Amen. Amen.
in a long way from dying now. Father God, we pray that you will bless our sister as you and Father and may have the honor and adoration. This thing is that these signs shall follow them as leave. They shall lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. We confess 